Greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener and a forest garden designer. And this is the start of today's uh, forest garden live stream, a backyard forest forest garden live stream. And I wanted to talk about art. Art. Well, actually, not really art. I've, I've written the, the, the slideshow, the presentation, and it really isn't about art. It kind of crosses over with design mostly it's about using native plants uh, in a garden and it kind of yeah touches on a, on a few things um, the <clears throat> the um, there we go it's connect connecting to chat there's a, a zoom call at 10 30 as well I, I don't know what the, the details are for um, off the top of my head but um but yes, uh, uh, hopefully somebody will paste the details into the Twitch chat, and then you can come along and meet up with people, uh, and um, and 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 yes, talk about um, talk about forest gardens. So the the slides will be available online when I fix my website, which is currently broken. And you press P to see the notes. Press the P key, and it gives you notes about about the talk. So there's links and stuff in there as well. So there's a couple of useful links in there. Uh, this really uh, the talk for today really came about for last Wednesday. Uh, there's a fantastic garden in New York, and I, there's a couple of really uh, uh, Margaret Roach, who is a an author and a podcaster over in New York State and uh, she's great she's absolutely brilliant uh, real kind of con concentrates on wildlife gardening and I've learned a lot when I first started gardening in earnest um, uh, five five six years ago uh, I just listened to <laughs> end to end I listened to all the, um, the a way to garden podcasts so I really recommend them and they, Wave Hill Gardens was a, was a, was on there. Uh, there's somebody a few a couple of times, and there's been people talking about from from Wave Hill Gardens. So they're really really excited, really exciting stuff going there. One of the gardens I'd like to find out more about actually was a, a, an ornamental native garden, but kind of very um, yeah, really really quite quite uh, regimented, really quite neat and tidy. And I love that idea of like a wildlife. A neat and tidy native wildlife garden. Now that for me is just that's just that's kind of that that's that's good. That's yeah, not getting away from the whole idea of a messy wildlife garden or an undesigned wildlife garden. You're actually getting to it's properly designed, it's neat and tidy and it looks smart, but it's also wild and it's also native. So that's Wave Hill Gardens in in, in New York. New York somewhere, not not terribly sure where. Anyway. They put on a talk last Wednesday, and um, it was Fergus Garrett who uh, is great. I've heard, uh, I've listened to him on uh, Sarah Wilson's Roots and All podcast, and uh, about the biodiversity uh, about a year ago or so. And yeah, really fantastic. I've been to uh, Great Dixter as well. As you may know, I am a forest gardener, not really an ornamental um, gardener, but it, it was still, it was still a yeah, a really good experience, and. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. My favourite bit was, <laughs> it's quite funny, walking through the meadow, uh, beautiful. That for me was the best and there's some trees and I just remember a meadow and just just l really liking it. And then we found, it was around the back of a utility area, we found somewhere to put down the picnic blanket away from people. It wasn't like the most gl glamorous of locations, but for me that was the highlight of just finding a little nook and cranny away from everybody else and being able to sit down and have, uh, we had um, our, our 10 year old Kaiki, that must have been, he was about two years old, three years old, so that was quite a few, a few years ago. So yeah, so great Dixter, fantastic gardens, um, and it's got a long history as well. Uh, Christopher Lloyd was the um, gardener before Fergus Garrett, and Fergus Garrett worked as worked 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 with Christopher Lloyd, and um, really kind of famous. And the house is designed by L Lutchins, um, and it's old. And the yes, so it's all very very kind of um, original gardens. Also really really interesting. This is not really what I was wanted to talk about but do have a look do investigate they've got a website and do look at Margaret Roach's um, A Way to Garden podcast and she's written a couple of books as well 
Um, so that was a talk and it was great. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm far, far more than I thought I would, to, to be honest, uh, because I'm not really an ornamental designer, and I, but it was about wildlife and gardening for wildlife at Great at Great Dixter. And I must say, Fergus Garrett, is, he's, he is hilarious. He's really, really entertaining and strikes me as somebody who has a kind of um, it's not a, it has strong opinions and but but his delivery is fantastic so there is a, a video to the talk um, which is on YouTube so I'm guessing it's public uh, if you click on the link um, it's unlisted but there's a recording on YouTube so it's about an hour and a half uh, so do have a look at that this is the the page the, the, the page at Wave Hill so do have a look at that really really good really really enjoyable but there was a few there, there there's one thing i had real issues about so and that is about the use of native uh native plants and this is a kind of it's a kind of small thing and a big thing i'm really kind of appreciative of uh, of people of gardeners like fergus and gardeners like margaret margaret and let's see first name terms um because they really do promote the idea of wildlife gardening and it does seem a bit of a quibble, but I don't think it's a minor quibble. I'm just kind of, from my background as a forest gardener, my take on on gardening is, it's the kind of whole view of it. And that you're actually starting off with wildlife and you start off with designing with for, for wildlife, for, the, for, for designing an ecosystem from scratch. And this is the whole idea, is that it's not an afterthought, it's not something you bolt on afterwards, it's something that is created at the beginning when you're designing the garden. So it's not a small thing. So I do think it's kind of, for, and it's for me, this is my personal take on it. So it's, a, as I say, it's more, of a, it's more of a critique rather than a criticism. So I really kind of admire uh, Fergus's work, um, but it more is a just kind of like questioning the kind of attitude towards native plants, UK native wildflowers. Uh, he started off the lecture talking about uh, the grim picture of biodiversity in the UK and mentioned a report. I think the report he was talking about. Oh, oh! By the way, we're having the render removed on the on the front of the house. There's um, some cement concrete render on the house, and we're having it removed. Obviously, right now today. So that's the noise you can hear in the background. So I think the report that Fergus was talking about was the State of Nature report published in 2019 by a range of different. Uh, charities organizations in the UK and there's a link there's a link here in the notes as well um, and he kind of said it is pretty grim just like the, the decline and it really is there is an ec ecological and climate emergency and I don't no matter the fact that it's not really mentioned every it's not headline news in the UK media it really is headline news we're, we're seeing the effects of it now constantly uh, and it's only going to get worse and the predictions are for it to get much much worse as well so there really does need to be systemic change in how we produce food how we look after nature our relationship with nature how we run our society and everyone has a role to play within that so yeah it's pretty grim it is it is grim but we can do a, a thing about we can engage and and push for change there's always three things that I say you can do as um, as, as, as a person. Firstly, go vegan. And that's really controversial. Well, it shouldn't be. Uh, farming is a massive uh, uh, greenhouse, producer of greenhouse gases. Secondly, stop flying. Don't fly. And the third thing is engage a activism. And this is something that really depends upon your situation, it depends upon your time, whether it's education, whether it's like creating a forest garden, whether it's a political engagement on a local level or a national level of getting involved in, in Greenpeace or Extinction Rebellion or just there's a whole range of different ways that everybody can get involved. But there does need to be an engagement and, 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 and uh, an engagement with the, the whole process. And one of the key things I'm... Um, so, so it's kind of really, really, it's really important. It's the reason why I get into forest gardening. I got into forest gardening in the first place was because it is, it is engaging and it's doing something. 
No, there were kind of the couple of key points that um, that Fergus made in his in his talk, and he said gardens are woodland edge, and I thought it was just brilliant because this is really is uh, forest gardening. Forest gardens are all about the woodland woodland edge. They are about the, the kind of definition of a forest garden. Um, my, my short definition is that it's an edible ecosystem or edible ecosystems because there's more there's a diversity of um, ecosystems in a forest garden. Um, but also the fact that it's um, it, you're, you're emulating woodland edge. So in a cool, temperate climate, so this is why I think forest gardening is so exciting because it's, it's applicable across across so many different uh, different regions of the world. Um, so you can have an edible ecosystem in, no, in, in all different different areas and different places. Whereas in a cool, temperate climate like ours here in West Wales, the idea is that you're creating a garden which is just on the cusp of woodland. It's on the woodland edge. It's not thick shaded wood it's woodland edge so you're getting light coming through from the trees there's enough light around the trees so you design a forest garden that, that there's there's a gap between the trees they're not they're not creating a canopy and that means that the, the understory plants can can um, get enough light uh, gardens are woodland edge and diversity is key and this is the other central kind of message a diversity of habitats and both of these are exactly what I talk about when I'm talking about what a forest garden is and how a forest garden operates and how it, how it functions woodland edge and diversity are two of the key definitions of a forest garden so I thought that was really really interesting uh, and then he talks about a biodiversity audit and finally, finally, finally gets round to a biodiversity audit after his wife, who's a zoologist and a uh, and an ecologist, tells says to him, do a bio biodiversity audit. And he finally gets around to it. And I this uh, this is the, this is the summary the the kind of conclusion from it there's masses and masses of different species of spider and some really entertaining stories about sp different species of spiders and different moths and oh, a whole range of different of, of different wildlife it's incredible but it's the kind of conclusions that are drawn that I find slightly um slightly, slightly worrying not worrying but it's more the uh, the the fact that he says the garden is richer than the wild land around it and he's talking about the kind of ornamental garden so there's like a montage here take a screenshot of the of the talk and i find that troubling really i find it troubling um mostly because in the garden as you can see from the photograph and this is a guess this is not i don't know for sure but i'm i'm guessing that most of the garden of the the, 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 the ornamental garden is mostly non-native so what is this this is an, a helenium i can't remember helenium autumnale or, or, or something the, this is a photograph from great dixter um and he and he says british flora is pretty poor uh and that is kind of in some respects that is true in comparison to flora around the around the world uh, he uh, Fergus creates quotes a figure of around two thousand four hundred or two thousand eight hundred species, and I think that's probably yeah. And, and I don't know. I'm not terribly sure where he gets the, gets the numbers from. I had a quick look, and um, from Grow Wild UK, which is an outreach project from RHS, the figure is sixteen uh, one thousand six hundred species, and I have got the links here to the to the website, and in. Um, a fantastic book this is the book that i recommend uh anyone who's interested in wildflowers is uh, harrop's wildflowers there are other really good books as well this isn't the only one but this is one i picked up it's kind of uh, a, a field guide to uh, uk uh, well british wildflowers so that's 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 ireland and britain and ireland and this there are about 800 uh species listed here and so and and apparently, according to oh, I can't remember where I saw this, there the, the the it's far less species than in mainland Europe, and the reason for this is that the ice age apparently quite literally scraped three quarters of the species off of the British Isles, uh, Britain and Ireland, and yeah, so there's a there's a real kind of lack in comparison to the uh, the the rest of Europe. I hate to say continental Europe because we are actually on the same continental shelf even though we are on island uh the rest of europe has a much kind of richer much richer flora but i still think that is plenty of species and i think it's a not not lazy but i think what happens is you know uh, uh, fergus has come from a tradition 
and uh, learn uh, ornamental in ornamental gardening and he's very very good at it he's really you know quite quite gifted but the whole of the education and the whole of the work is all geared around non-natives i mean there are native plants in there but it's all geared around non-natives whereas i think that really we ought to be in in in, in light of the ecological emergency we ought to be looking at, at native flowers but uh, a native a native species and that and to say that it's a uh, british flora is pretty poor is, is, is kind of dodging the buck really because there are so many combinations a decent design if you're a decent garden designer there are plenty absolutely plenty of combinations of of, of uk native wildflowers that you can use so this does smack of human supremacy. This is a kind of term coined by uh, Benjamin Vogt, who um, is an American, he's kind of American native plant proponent garden designer. Well, I've got a lot of time for Benjamin Vogt. Um, yeah, he's a bit prickly, but he's, he's very funny. I, uh, um, and he's written a book, New Garden Ethic, and saying we ought to use, he uses all native plants but i just think it should be just for for and as a forest gardener as well it should be a starting point that you're using natives where possible so yes and i think yeah there's um uh, that margaret roach was far more she's far more kind of on board with it really and i can ask, i asked a question during the during the talk at the, at the end for the end of the talk at about what your attitude would be to creating a new garden from scratch and your attitude would be towards native plants and that's Fergus was a bit well well yeah I do use some but only if they work whereas I think it ought to be the other way around use use them as a basis for what you've got um Doug Tallamy this is a uh, who's a very well-known ecologist and uh, and gardener and promoting use of gardens for 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 ecology uh, was has a kind of 70 30 rule so 70 percent native and 30 percent non-native as a kind of rule of thumb as a rough rule of thumb and then that's that that's that's absolutely fine because i i do think what what happens is you fergus is kind of misrepresenting it really because you're missing out on the context this is a oopsie let's get let's get that bigger oh this one here so you can i don't know if you can see that this is a um this is a photograph of uh, a satellite photograph of Great Dixter, and you can see it in its surroundings. And it is surrounded by woodland and uh, meadow, and there's a it's, it's actually quite a diverse patchwork of it's in the you know it's on the edge of town, it's in the, in the countryside. There's there's a diversity. The context within which it is in is kind of very different to a lot of other to a lot of other places so it's not just the ornamental garden that is supply that is like the source of all this diversity it's as he says as he quite rightly says it's a mosaic it's a mosaic of different habitats a diversity of habitats and that's what you want is a like a diversity of habitats is a kind of fundamental thing so all that wildlife like here in west wales for example we've got there's uh, agricultural fields and there's old there's an old track an old road which goes up and it has ash trees and cherry trees on it and i had a moth person around here and uh, a moth expert and i was talking to him about the species different species and he said this is absolutely ideal situation you've got a valley with a wooded steep steep wooded valley with uh with some 100 150 100 about 100 year old trees and then you've got a trees up a track and then you've got grassland you've got rough pasture and you've got all this different habitat going on he said this is ideal ideal for uh habitat range of habitats for moths and micro moths and it's the same kind of thing it's 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 not just the you know the 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 insects might be going to the ornamental garden but they're not eating it <laughs> you, know, you they're they're not that's not necessarily where they're where they're breeding so uh orange tip i think it's orange tip which orange tip butterfly which lays its larvae on um on nettles and then they will f i can't remember there's half a dozen species that do and then it will get the flower from 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 different from they get the nectar from from other flowers and that's kind of part of what's going on so the kind of context of Great Dixter is very different to what most most gardens will be about. 
Similarly, there's a lot of old buildings. They're like uh, some really, really. I do remember that as well. Some beautiful old timber frame, um, timber frame barns and outbuildings and gates and stone walls. And there's all this kind of habitat, and that's as much a part of the biodiversity as the plants in the ornamental garden. And it's an eight acre site as well. So it's like there, there, there's a huge amount of space. And I think it's worth pointing this out really because it's not really, I think it's doing native plants a disservice. Uh, and I think there could be more kind of appreciation of them, but also more kind of promotion of them. And, and, and the reasons for that I'll come on to. So what you really got to think about is the function of uh, a garden i think this is kind of this is kind of interesting not this isn't really about art but it's it kind of is because the function of great dixter is that it's a show garden yeah it's it there's it's it's staffed by a huge number there's a huge number of staff that work there a huge number of gardeners and support staff it's all about a show it's like a like a kind of floral firework display which is con keeping everything constantly up in the air and it's really high maintenance and he says so and this is part of the reason for the biodiversity because you've got people digging up plants and putting plants down and changing and so you're getting all the kind of pioneer species getting in there and all the the, the kind of flora the fauna that relies upon that it's all kind of happening another example he talks about he talked about the meadow which was which was really really interesting and uh the fact that he that different parts of the meadow are cut at different times of the year uh, so to encourage biodiversity and nor you know kind of normally you'd have one field and this is how a field would be would have a meadow would have been managed would have it would have been like an early cut and a late cut or you know whatever the different types of different types of management are whereas he was actively uh, experimenting he is actively experimenting with different meadow cuts at different times of the year different heights and different times in in the meadow and that is really 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 high maintenance it's like a lot of work um and the other thing about that is um it's it's kind of high art you know is it, it this is it's about the show it's about how the, the how the plants look it's about the interaction with the the audience and the show it's like entertainment it's it's up there it's like well hey come along and experience a great day out and it's kaboom kabang it's really in your face whereas the forest garden <laughs> similarly here we've got uh <laughs> And the forest garden here we've got i've got two we've got two one acre forest gardens well actually we've got the nuttery as well which is about it's about two eight about an acre and so two acres including the coppice so there's about four acres of of kind of garden that's being maintained and there's two of us both of us working uh and with two children uh, at school and yeah we <laughs> we got we're doing it part time and we've got other jobs to do and money to earn and all the rest of it. So it's very different and it's just us and it's just kind of it's it very as you can see from the picture, there's docks. Oops, there's docks in it. <laughs> there, there's all sorts of grass and weeds and, and everything else. But it is very low maintenance and we're getting there. It's a, a forest garden is a long is a is a bit of a long haul but it's a very low maintenance garden and it's designed for that it's a functional garden it's for creating it's for growing edible crops as well as for the for the for, for the wildlife yep and it's kind of like low art you know i think it's beautiful there's some meadow sweet here this is a cornus hedge i'm not sure which one it is actually cornus ericae or cornus sanguinea um don't know i think it might yeah it might be the native cornus not not sure and there is a oh, what is that meadow sweet and there's some sweet sicily in there as well and there's an asturian tree cabbage and it's all a bit yeah but some beautiful i mean meadow sweet's absolutely stunning stunning um native plant like some um, kind of part part shade and um, moist conditions uh so there's it is beautiful in its own in its own way and I kind of for me the the beauty of it, it's a very different beauty and it's a very different art it's kind of low art quote unquote and just as by comparison I just took a couple of screenshots 
uh, Fergus was talking about uh, Great Dixter. He was talking about creating different habitat, which is brilliant. Really, really good. Really, I really totally recommend this. Uh, that you create different like log piles uh, or like dead hedges. Anyone, who, <laughs> anyone who knows who's been on the uh, the, the Backyard Forest chat or, or has seen any of my live streams before, I'm always, always, always making dead dead hedges. Um, and I think it's really, really important to create habitat, to create a diversity of habitat. So uh, um, um, Fergus was talking about creating uh, land art and I'm making, <laughs> I've been making windbreaks. And they're kind of similar, and they're the same. They're habitat, but it, it's it is the same. Yeah, it's the same bloody thing, but it's doing very different. It's doing very very different things. If you're creating a dead hedge, I totally totally recommend getting into dead hedges. If you've, it depends on the size of your garden and how exposed you are. But the dead hedges are brilliant. There's a, I think it's a sweet chestnut here. It might be no, it's a stone pine. Yeah, it's a stone pine here. <clears throat> Quite steep, uh, south southwest facing slope. And I've put dead hedges on all the individual trees. This is over in the in the nuttery, and they're fantastic because they provide a, little bit, a bit of protection, not like total protection for the plant, but they provide a bit of protection for the for the young tree, and the young tree gets established. Uh, and it's a really good way of getting yeah getting rid of like bramble and and trimmings and brash and all sorts of all sorts of crap that you wouldn't normally you normally have to put on a bonfire or something or take years to compost down but dead hedges are the way to go and then we're going to slowly grow a, a, a living windbreak hedge and put that in as well so this is like high art versus low art land art versus windbreaks um but they're the same thing and i do think i just at this point the, the idea for high art and low art in a garden really reminds me of um this book by a guy called Stuart Brand who <clears throat> uh, worked on the Whole Earth catalogue back in the 70s, 80s and wrote a book How Buildings Learn which is from a TV, BBC TV series. It's brilliant. If you are at all interested in design, get hold of a copy of this book uh, and or watch the TV series. It's all available on on um, YouTube. Where is the book gone? Oh, here it is. So yeah. It's all available. This is this is the book, but the TV series is available on YouTube, and there is a link in the notes. Uh, oh yeah, I've got the note. There's a link here for the TV series. Go and have a look. It's it's fantastic. And he has an idea, a concept of a low road and a high road architecture, and the the kind of low road stuff is what people live in. How people how the buildings adapt and the buildings learn and the buildings change according to who's living in them and how they're being used and there's lots of really really good examples about it as well and so about maintenance and about usage and then you have the high road which is uh, really kind of monumental big museums or big bank buildings all kind of monolithic and designed and built in one great big grow rather than being organically grown or, or kind of adapted and changed so do have a look and I do think yeah really kind of pisses me off though when people I think it's what you're designing designing it for and I think it's fine absolutely fine to have a show garden so long as you're kind of aware that it is a show garden and it's art is it art is it not art I, I like kind of, it's kind of very ornamental and it's for it's very showy but when you design like a garden like most the majority of gardens design is not how how things look i mean it's part of it but it's not how things look design is how things work and how things look is a part of that and you're kind of encouraging people to use a space in a certain way or kind of feel secure in a certain way for example big thing uh has been about designing exercise space in the garden and this is kind of really really important for me you know i i, I do a bit of um a bit of qigong and it's nice to be enclosed it's nice to be private in that space that you have you don't want any old person looking over and seeing what you're doing it's a kind of private it's a private thing it's a private practice so that's really really important to kind of incorporate this is how things how things work and how things function how things how people feel within that space um so yeah it's not how things look 
Um, um, yeah. So get hold of a copy of that book if you're at all interested in design, garden design, web design, building design, whatever. But do get hold of a copy of the book and have a look at the video. And this kind of leads me on to the danger. What the, prob the problem is, the reality is that most people's garden, most people do not have eight acres of historically important uh, ornamental kind of show gardens with a variety of different habitats and all the rest of it. Most people with the visitors, the danger is that people, when they come to Great Dixter, they say, oh, wow, look at the tropical garden. I want a bit of this and they want the look yeah they want that's what they're concentrating on that's what they're seeing that's what they're immersed in that's what they get with the big floral displays that's what they want that's what they want to take home that's what they go but their reality is very different the majority of people i can't remember the, the how big an average garden is it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as more uh, uh, as um yeah the average guard the, the new build gardens are much smaller but they've got a very, very different reality with a very different context. So I think it's really essential to, you know, I think it's that people start to demand non-native plants. But I think there is a responsibility on the part of show gardens like Great Dixter to show what will work for them as well. Not saying exclusively not saying oh you know you can't have any tropical plants and you can go you know the, the you get people who are native plant obsessives and it becomes this very all kind of binary native non-native and it becomes an argument it becomes abusive and that's just that's just, just not going to help anybody but i do think it's important that we have a uh, that there is a responsibility to show people how native plants could could work so it's a show garden not just being kind of a big very showy but a show garden in how in showing people what can work for them yeah so this is the danger this is the danger i think of writing off native plants at a um native plants and wildflowers at a garden like great dixter so there i, I feel that there is a responsibility to, to encourage people to use native plants which isn't really being met at the moment so a bit controversial but you know whatever um and as part of this i have a there's a, a non-profit set up a non-profit community interest company which is promoting uk natives in uh, in uk horticulture and the idea is to uh create artful photographs of um of combinations of wildflowers uk native wildflowers and then put them up in a gallery and share that gallery so people can get an idea and a flavor of what they can use and what's available and i'm doing it with two fantastic people there's sarah wilson uh she's garden designer and podcaster roots and all podcast and barry stewart who is uh, an ecologist and a um he runs with Celtic wildflowers so you can buy wild well uk wildflowers from 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 there as well but yeah, really, really uh, important. Really, really important. I think to promote this, and so my challenge, <laughs> my challenge is, please showcase UK natives at Great Dixter. Not the whole garden, but just please do show people what they can do with it. I it's, this is all new for me. I'm not an expert. You know, I don't have the experience in ornamental gardening, but this is something I really, really want to learn about. And there is so little material out there. Like there is no books. There are no. There are a couple of books, and there are like one's about ten years old. One's about twenty years old about using you, uh, wild wildflowers in a in a garden. But nothing, nothing like they got in North America. So please, can someone, well, write a book about it? But also. Um, Plate gardens, show gardens like Great Dixter, please can you showcase UK natives? So and use and my kind of message to everybody really, the native challenge to everybody is use natives where possible. And that's in a forest garden and that's not. And I've been absolutely amazed. Um when I've been doing the research for the Garden Wild project, the number oh yeah, I've got a spreadsheet. I've got a garden wild spreadsheet, but the number of plants, UK native plants, which are in Plants for a Future, which is a fantastic resource of useful plants. Uh, the UK natives, pretty much every single one, pretty much, with a couple of exceptions, is in the Plants for a Future website. So yeah, there are there's a whole world to explore there, uh, which kind of goes beyond how they look. So yeah. 
But this is, as I say, this is not a criticism. This is a suggestion. This is a critique and a suggestion for, for, for great dicks to, to please use um, Showcase UK Native Wildflowers. Uh, uh, but I really wish, I really do want to point out that I think Fergus and Margaret are brilliant and I, I wish there were more, more gardeners like them. So there we go. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Um, I shall say goodbye now and then I shall look at the chat. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>